Thanks, everybody. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm a little bit on a problem because I've broke my keyboard and I don't have the N word. So I'll try not to use N as a, as a character. <laughs> Come on, that's fun. So first of all, I'd like to start with thanking all of you from, from the Zio community. I'm, as Adam said, an external observer. So as an external observer, I'm not really active on, on, on your community, except when, when we bother. Mostly the, those guys <laughs> with questions about the internals of, of Zio. Why do we bother them with the, with the internals of Zio? Well, because porting it to TypeScript required to do a line-by-line -line port. So it's effectively source code almost equivalent to, uh, to Zio. It was a funny project to do. The other side of thank yous that, that, I, wanna, um, that I wanna do is to John and Sandra. We have been working on, on offering uh, public workshops together with my company that I'm CEO of Matex. We've been working for like a year and a half, two years. Has been fantastic, so thank you guys. And with that, I'll start in my actual talk. I don't have many slides, but I have a few. I don't like too, too much slides, but just to keep everything in line. So, as I was saying with my company and a few other folks, we've been porting Zio from Scala to TypeScript, almost on a line-by-line -line basis. Scala and TypeScript have similarities, but also a good degree of differences. It's quite curious that we have realized the, well, that's my personal belief, that the, the optimal set of trade-offs to do proficient functional programming in TypeScript is very similar to the set of trade-offs that you guys have in Scala. Why am I saying this? Uh, you do functional programming. Functional programming is historically done with abuse of type classes and very complex type level mechanisms that are, lucky for you, very verbose in Scala. So you don't want to use it on a day-by-day -day basis. There are extremely powerful features that you don't want to use on a day-by-day -day, day -day basis. So, Zio came out with a great idea about a way not to use type classes while still providing sort of the same level of gains that you can have as a consumer of the library. So Zio is testable. Zio has many of the benefits of programming with type classes without the added cost of type classes. And that by all means not to say that type classes are bad. In TypeScript, we don't have higher kind of types. We cannot have type classes. We still run a simulation because they are indeed useful things. One aspect that sort of I kind of like from, from, from the very early moment, it's like TypeScript and Scala are getting closer progressively over time. It started with TypeScript getting inspiration from Scala, most likely. That's fair enough to say. But also in, with Scala 3, there's some TypeScript concepts that have been sort of borrowed, reinterpreted, and made native citizens of the, of the new compiler of Dolly. Which is, by the way, a language I love. So this talk is by no means comparing two languages for pros and cons. It's comparing two languages for their strength, comparing two languages for their expressivity, and they're both extremely great languages to be used, most likely in different circumstances. This is a Scala talk, so I'm gonna talk primarily about Scala. I haven't placed any TypeScript example in here, but if time allows us, I'll show a little bit of TypeScript. I don't think so, but let's see. Anyway, what, what can we really learn from, from TypeScript? 
First of all, I'd like to say that Effect DS is already being used in production for quite a while. It's almost 100% complete as a port of Zeo and has been roughly stable for a year and something. So it's not like it's a one-day project that, that only came out recently. We have some feedback that, that comes from having used that in, I think, the, the largest code base that at the moment runs effect. It's in the order of the 100K lines of code, of effect code, not of code in general. That's by no means a small piece of code. And of course, there are many applications. And I have to say you learn a lot when you, you start with a pilot, with a, with a prototype, you know, on a single file, and, and you think the, the, paradigm you, the, the paradigm you invented were like nice when you, when you start to use it on 100K lines of code. Uh, all the errors come up. All the, all the introspection that you have to do in, in redesigning the, the API. Anyway. TypeScript, what can we learn? Well, using unions to represent errors gives you an open set of possibilities, as opposed to a closed set of possibilities when representing errors in a closed tree, which is something we'll, we'll look at later. What can we gain by using union types? As I said, the, the set of potential errors is open. So you can, like, import other, a library, like could be Zio AWS, something we've seen today, Zio Quill, any, any of the Zio libraries. They're going to be built around Zio. They raise errors. They raise most likely very good typed errors. You just can't use those in your app. You have to use every time you call an external library, map error, and get back to your own domain. That's acceptable, but it's a limitation on reusability. It's a limitation of reusability of third-party code, and it's a limitation of reusability of your code. Because unless you have a very, very small code base, usually your code is distributed across different packages. Company-wise, you reuse portions, and ideally you don't want every time to have a completely different error hierarchy. Similar to unions, intersections are also an optimal way to represent environments. Same reasoning here, and I won't spend too much time on here, on, on this point, because actually 0.2.0 already realized that. So there's, there's no point giving additional feedback on, on something that is already there. What I'm gonna show is hopefully something I can contribute to on, on the intersection side, if it works. If it doesn't, friends like before. The third aspect, and, and here I'm gonna get burned, but variance is bad. Why variance is bad? Well, variance is not bad. Variance is good, generally. But if you use it together with type inference, which is also, by the way, a very good functionality, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot to the point where you just can't recognize where bugs are introduced. Just to shine a little bit of light on this, the very internals of the Zeo Fiber 1.0 had a mistake for that. I couldn't compile it in TypeScript because we don't really have good variants, or at least we have implicit variants, which is by no means the same type of variants that you have in Scala. Namely, it doesn't automatically unify types, only works if you can pass a subtype or a, or a supertype of something. But why did we realize there was a bug? In TypeScript, it wasn't compiling. I go in the Zio contributors' channels. Friendly Adam answer, yeah, seems like a bug. That's not to say TypeScript is better than Scala. No, 
Not at all. It's just to say variance and type inference used together are a risky problem. Which is also why in many, in many code bases today you don't see uh, a lot of type inference used. At least not, not used in a large sense. Can be used very, very precisely in some places, but not, not as, a, as a general thing. It's a very different experience in TypeScript. You almost never annotate the types manually. The difference is it doesn't unify types. So you're not in a risk of getting to any's if you're talking about outputs, objects, nothing, if we're talking about inputs. Anyway, what would we love? First of all, who's we? All of the people like me that use both TypeScript and Scala almost on a daily basis and that love both of the ecosystems. Fundamental idea behind Zio, and it's the main reason why I've liked Zio from the, from the very first moment that John gave a talk introducing the third type parameter. I didn't like functional programming in Scala up to that point at all. I wasn't doing functional programming at all. Too verbose, not enough game for me. I have a math background. I studied mathematics at university. So by all means, I like the formalism in functional programming. It was just a realization. Anyway, the, the very idea behind Zio is that it represents as a concrete data type a generic computation. So any piece of computation. And if you think about any chunk of code without knowing anything specific about that, you can probably say three things. This code will require some external dependencies or not. This code might fail or not. This code will produce an output or not. Those three things you can say about every piece of code. They're fundamental. I think they have, they, they have been discovered. They haven't been invented. You guys have invented that, but as a general concept, discover things are natural things that, like in, in physics, you, you might say general relativity is a, is a fundamental theory. It's not invented, it's discovered. We logically expect the compositions of two computations. If we forget about zero, if we forget about variance, if we forget about Scala, just talking about two pieces of code, and I ask you, if I run the first piece of code and then I run the second piece of code, what might happen? Well, for sure, you're gonna have to have both of the dependencies of the first piece of code you, you run and the second. That's identifiable as, a, as an end type, as an intersection type. It's not really defined as a, one of the closest common types that extends both. That's something forced into a language. That's probably the closest representation that we could get in Scala 2. And that's perfectly fine. <laughs> in TypeScript, we have many uh, other non-expressible things that in Scala are very well expressible and that we have to hack around in TypeScript having slightly different uh, develop, development experience. But variance has never been a logical representation of multiple things happening. It always has been a representation of lowest or highest depending if it's contravariant or covariant, common type. We'd love to explore type inference to its maximum. Why am I saying this? Have you ever worked on a large Z application and have you ever had to add an error in something very low level, something deep, and you had like to handle that error from something at the very top. The amount of type signatures you have to change is unbelievable because the error is typed in every single function. The environment is typed in every single function. You never leave them for inference to work. 
So if you change something, you have to manually update everything, rather than just adding a new case and a new failure scenario that will automatically propagate up to the point where you are handling errors and where you do have a, a strict type annotation that limits what, what your types can be. Only at that point, the error will be reported as something that the Scala compiler will tell you, look, I can't, those two types don't match. But not in, in every layer in between. And here by layer, I just mean application layer, I don't mean Z layers. So we would really love to, to exploit type inference to, to the maximum while still being safe. That's, that's an idea that comes from, from other functional languages. The idea of having the compiler as a friend, having the compiler as someone to who you speak while you're writing code. Not as a guardian, but as a friend. So you are discovering what you write as long as you're writing it. It's not widely, uh, well, there's disagreements on if that's good or bad. I'm here to give a talk, so I share my own opinion. But I'm not saying the other side is wrong. So let's play. As I said, I don't like too many slides, so I've just done five. As I said, Zero 2.0 has already picked up on some of the ideas in a totally independent manner. <laughs> That's good that some things are discolored and not invented. I've built 100, 200 lines prototype to explore a potential API for, for Zio full in Scala 3. That was just for fun and to eventually give this type of feedback. It's by no means something you should use. <laughs> something you shouldn't use by any means. Everything I show you today, you can find in this, this repository. And there is a git pod ready to scale, ready to code. Link. I won't rerun everything because Scala in git pod requires a custom Docker image, which takes a little bit of time to build, and I already have it opened. So if it works, that's what I use. As long as it's not N, it works. <laughs> so anyway, we set 0 2.0. By the way, guys, amazing work. Have a bunch of traits that represent services, most obvious thing. Then some access functions, some utility functions. Kit has this morning laid out very well what, what they mean, so I won't, I won't go into too many details on that. And then we define some, some errors, just error A and error B in this case. Then we have a, a program where we don't annotate the return type. As you can see, this program well, we'll fail for reason A because it happens before, but if you're not keeping track of anything, this computation, you might say, it can fail for either error A or error B. Now let's inspect this type. That, my friend, is a useless type. We have a type error channel, it's object. There's nothing we can know about this type. That's not useful. So what do you do? Well, you know that behind the scenes, Zio is implemented using variants. You know how variants work. And you create a sealed trait of your potential errors, knowing that variants will infer the closest one. Very good in doing that. And here we can see that the variance correctly inferred the proper type parameter. Proper, I wouldn't say proper, but good enough type parameter 
that for this case is very precise. But I might have another 500 cases here. Error C. I have a C. And now, when I get to deal with that, I have no idea if that effect, if that zero can fail for reason A, reason B, or reason C. So what do you do? And that's real life. Well, you know that traits are composable, so you build a tree of trees, the most obvious thing you could do. So you have a basic seal trait up error, which usually they don't really have any, any concrete error type unless you have very generic things. And then you go specific on, on some small trees. Like in this case, we have database error um, that extends up error. And you have two implementations, which is query failure and connection failure. Those are both database errors. Then I have some domain errors. So like invalid user ID and invalid email. Those two things don't necessarily mix up. But if you are in this case and you have a procedure that realistically only touches the, the database, let's, for example, remove validation from here. Oh. I can't, <laughs> I can't say unit. <laughs> Zero dot unit. Yes. The autocomplete. I don't have uh, the tool you had, the, the GitHub, uh, the copilot. By the way, if I know who should I bother to get copilot, please tell me later. But anyway, uh, let's check. This is a query failure. Fine. Save user. Only does query query failure. The mo the moment I add. I'm sorry. Let's now, to be very clear, remove the validation side. And also the return type. And now it's only a domain error. So it doesn't bubble back to, to up errors every time. Let's re -add. And if everything is correct, now it's up error. And I'm back to the point where I don't really know what's happening. But if you build those trees very precisely, which I would say it's a very logical thing to do, and something in many cases you should do anyway, then my, my types are precise enough to be used without annotating at every single step what is happening at the type level. So let's take a look at How could this look in Scala 3 with union intersection types and a little bit of trickery to do partial providing, partial elimination of things? By the means, I should say, uh, I program since the, like, the last 16 years. I've wrote code every single day, but I'm not by any means an expert in Scala, especially in Scala 3. Just playing here. We have a few services. The tag, in my case, it's explicit. For fun, I didn't want to redo the whole Izumi Reflect project, <laughs> which is <laughs> a little bit complicated, as you might well inspect in a, in a video of like two weeks ago in, from, from Kit. Anyway, that's, that's the only difference, really. I've called it effect just because in effect it's called effect, yes, but uh, no, I'm joking. I didn't want any conflict with zero. Anyway, to cut it short, same problem, same program as before, but now if you look at that type, 
that tells you exactly what's going on inside the effect. That tells you the precise reasons of failure. Let's see. We want to handle only a single error, only error A. The return type no longer has error A in it. This is a type that represents very closely what is happening during your complete computation. That is representing the, comp the logical flow of your application. Let's see injecting something partial because this, this morning problem. Well, I think there is a trick to do that and I'll show the trick. But it's also very nice. You inject something, it disappears from the type signature. There is something to be said. Implementing a function is about removing types, implementing a functionality. Using that functionality is about introducing types. That's how it works in, in the very essence of compilers. That's how it works here. You use something, you introduce a new type. I'm using the console, I need the console in my environment. I'm implementing the console, implementing the functionality, the type is removed. Just to show you, there's not much time left, actually I finished my time, I believe, but <laughs> just to show you the, the behind the scenes, that's the whole extent of this prototype code. It's quite funny because it's stack safe even though it's small. I guess I can't write a recursive interpreter. I just get not good with myself. But regardless of uh, blah blah, that's the inject method. How do we do extraction? Well, <laughs> as Kit properly pointed out, the order of things is important. So what's the trickery here? Well, we moved this thing to the very right, so it happens later on, down the path. These are two, has zero limitation, that's the environment you are going to provide. That's a method on the effect data type, so that will be accessed through dot notation. So you do effect dot inject, or space inject in Scala 3 syntax, if you wanna use that sort of like. Then it requires an implicit tag for R2. And then it requires an implicit evidence that the intersection of R2 and R3, which is phantom in this context, effectively returns an effect that only requires R3. Of course, if you provide strange stuff in R2, you will not have an evidence that the intersection of something is your current R, but if you provide proper things, the Scala compiler is smart enough to figure it out that that EV, that evidence, is an identity, pull it in automatically, and there you go, you have partial erasure. A little bit more sort of strange and worked around one, catch some to catch partially. Same type of trickery and implicit evidence at the end that discern the two types with the, with the difference that you do need a little bit more of type material and it's the reason why if you check this syntax, in this syntax you have a case and then you have to return a tuple where the first argument is the error itself. That's required only at type level. It's necessary because of type level things, let's put it that way. I haven't found any other workaround. That's everything I had for today. I hope it was fun. Thank you again. If you have any questions, I'm here.
Thank you so much. That was a really thought-provoking presentation. I think you're probably one of the most sophisticated users of, of Zio's functionality, both implementing it yourself in a different language. So it's really helpful to get your thoughts and your feedback. And I think some of us are going to be going back and uh, seeing what we can do with that uh, later tonight. I think if, uh, if we can get that working in Scala 2 and Scala 3, you're going to be seeing that very shortly. I'd be happy to contribute it if you guys need any help on that. That, that would be. I'm not sure it works. But that would be if fantastic. it works, yeah, I'm here. We would, we would love that, yeah. Um, all right. Well, again, thank you so much. This was really fantastic.